It's time for us to tell you the things we got right, but to avoid this being the shortest podcast ever, we'll also tell you the things we got wrong. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right. We're going to do some season wrap-up stuff here, but there's other news that is broken and other things going on, so it'll be a little bit topical and a little bit reflective. As you can hear, my voice starting to recover. Not recovered, but starting to recover, but I've got my AG1 from Athletic Greens in hand, which I'm drinking, which will almost surely solve the problem. Um, Just a quick little bit of admin. As many of you let me know, and I appreciate you for keeping me honest, I had not announced the winner of the review competition for the one year of free Patreon, but I am prepared to do so now. The random number generator did its thing. We took emails, we took Twitter DMs, we took Discord DMs, we took private messages on Facebook and Instagram um, of people who sent in their reviews, and I want to thank you all so, so much for doing it. And Jack Kerrigan was the first one pulled out by the random number generator, and an email has been sent to Jack. And Josh Lavorn was also picked, and an email has been sent to Josh as well. So that, I think, is the bulk of the admin for today. I really don't think we have anything else to bore you with. I'm really, really sorry. Usually I can get to at least four minutes of admin, but I don't have any more to say. So I guess I will just introduce Paul. You can find him on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hello, pause. Ah, Whoa, still getting the mic trouble. Woo-hoo! All right, I'm, ba- That's I'm a back in back. the flow now, guys. I'm back That's in the call flow. back to the live event where Paul continuously refused to use the microphone. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Hello, indeed. Um, that's an improvement on my last podcast where I introduced Tim twice uh, <laughs> after saying that I had three quarters of a brain. So I guess I have half a brain. Um, oh, so I, I think there's a few things we need to cover. So the club obviously starting to already think about next season and how that squad's going to look for next season. Part of that is, of course, incomings. And we love discussing incomings and we will discuss incomings. But a part of that is deciding who from the current squad is going to stay and who is going to go. Um, it looks like two players are either already signed to stay in one instance or on the cusp of signing to stay, and that is Mohamed Elneny and Eddie Nketiah. And I think these are both fascinating moves. And these are the kind of things I really like in a way because sometimes I feel really strongly, Clive, about my opinions. I don't know if you've noticed that. But sometimes I really see both sides to the argument. And I love when that happens because I find it really fun to try to f- discover in real time with you and with Paul and with Tim, with Scott, which side of the argument is more compelling. So I'm curious to see where I come down on this when we're done discussing, because I'm not really sure where I am, I am on it now. Let's start first with Eddie and Kedia, because I think it is the bigger, more relevant factor in our squad and how we build it than the El Neni news. So the rumor is that Eddie and Kedia has been offered a five-year deal on 100,000 pounds per week. And that he is on the brink of accepting it, having reversed course from having really decided he wanted to leave. Let's start high level. Just your opinion on Eddie and Kedia staying versus going as it fits into the puzzle pieces of our attack next season. Yeah, we had a little chat about it yesterday, didn't we? I think for me... Uh, let me just reference what you mean. Over on Patreon, we did a Tielemann scouting video. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning of it, but if you want the Tielman scouting video, it's on Patreon. And it was okay, really, sorry. really good, and I forget how good Clive and Elliot are on this shit. It was really, really good. The really and good. Elliot sounded like an asterisk, but but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Your mileage may vary. Clive, please, please get us back on track. I apologize. Yeah, so I think it's, 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 it's an interesting one. Right? I think Eddie's proven he can play at the level. No, No drama there. I don't think you can look at any of these things without understanding what the final picture is going to look like. And in my mind, I have, and I'm developing a picture. I think I sent out on the WhatsApp today. That's it. I've got my list. I know what we're doing. <laughs> I'm not going to move, more or less. And um, in my mind, we need to have Eddie stay. It was Eddie stay or Balogun come back. That was always it for me. So we're going to be one academy player in the group. So for me, Balogun goes out. And two new signings come in, and that is assuming that Pepe goes, Lacazette goes, obviously Aubameyang's just gone. So there needs to be two more attacking signings, one who can play central and wide, and for me, I'd like to see a tall forward, right, that brings us something that we don't have. Eddie can play central and left. Um, I've got I've got an idea what I do at, at the right side, 
And obviously for me, it's knowing El Nene is now staying, it's it's one in centre midfield, right? So if we if we are serious, we have a, we have a choice to make, right? And this is a this is a dilemma because we can all see since January the squad is really unified and looks together, and they all seem to genuinely, genuinely, genuinely like each other. All of them, they seem to be really tight. But this ain't Butlins, right? It's a football club, and we need to lift the level of the squad. <laughs> Yeah. And just because people like each other doesn't mean they should stay together. That's what Wenger ended up doing. That's why Karen Chambers have been at the club for like 33 years until he left recently, right? Because he's a nice guy and, and you need to focus on lifting the level of the squad and you you can't just keep people around because they're good guys. However, with, with Eddie, I think, obviously Academy kid, if he was to go somewhere, he would probably get a £5 million signing on fee and a hundred thousand pound a week, job done. So Arsenal are probably giving him a, a signing on fee over the length of his contract, and that probably would incorporate into his salary. Probably makes him around seventy grand a week. But his run costs, if all the bonuses come in over five years, could be up to a hundred thousand pound a week. That's smart business. We haven't got to pay a transfer fee for him. It's already here. It makes sense. It's all about your ability to pay. And he fits into model quite nicely as a rotational forward, as long as he is a rotational forward for me, you know. And um, because we're back to lifting the level again, aren't we? And there needs to be a level lift. And if that's under threat, Elliot, I'm sure you'll have something yeah. to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that you can create two baskets of risk for this move, Paul. Basket one is the economic risk, right? Which is a hundred grand a week. If he doesn't pan out, we can't sell him. We can't move him. We eat the wages. That basket feels fairly irrelevant to me because it is a small amount. We should point out, by the way, all reporting on wages is a nonsense at some level. Some wages are much, much higher because they're inflated by aspects of the transaction that are not published. Others are a nonsense because they're just misreported. So we can only compare against wages as we understand them but we probably don't really understand them. Having said that, at around £5 million per year on the top end with no transfer fee, this is a relatively inexpensive move, even if we have to eat all of it. It's not the kind of move where you say we couldn't do other stuff we wanted because we had sunk cost in Eddie. So the basket of risk that I would call the economic risk to me is not relevant. The other basket of risk, and this is always a part of the risk I feel like does not get talked about enough with players, is opportunity cost. And this, to me, is the basket that matters, as Clive referenced, which is, is there a strengthening of the attack that we don't do, an acquisition we don't make, because we've chosen to stick with Eddie? And I would hasten to point out that if Eddie is staying, it also probably comes with Mikel convincing him that he is a big part of the plan, not a fringe part of the plan, And so the basket of risk that matters to me is, does an Arsenal next season with Eddie as a big part of the attacking plan get better enough to achieve our goals? And that's what I want to turn over to you. Let's not talk about the economics of it for the moment because unless you totally disagree with me about my conclusion there, let's talk about the opportunity cost of it for a moment. With Eddie being a player we build around, I'm not saying maybe maybe as a starter, but as a key piece, versus maybe letting him go and adding an additional key piece in his place. So, very short word on the economics, which I think there's there's one framing that really matters is, like, let's take Ben White, 50 million, a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, let's take Pepe, 72 million, huge amount of money, <laughs> way too much. Let's take William, a lot of money. But the difference between those three players is one played for us almost every game and was good. So there's economics and there's, did we, like, I don't mind overpaying for a guy by 20% if he plays a lot. If so we if you use extract him. value, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Once you buy it, if you, you, you know, it's kind of like a, an article of clothing. If you buy an article yeah. of clothing that you never wear because you hate it, it wasn't a value. If you buy an yeah. expensive pair of jeans, but you wear them every day, there's more value. I, I get that. You need yeah. to extract the value for what you're paying. So hopefully what we're getting with Eddie is we really know him. He really knows us. 
We know what we're getting. He'll get used. We've got loads of games. We need rotation. So hopefully that's a big piece of it. He can't be the answer. So when I look at Eddie, I'm assuming Gabriel Jesus is coming, right? Are we all, or, or somebody very, very similar. Um, now it could end up in somebody totally different, but somebody's coming, uh, a mainline star. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I can easily imagine Jesus and Eddie playing in the same team. Uh, Jesus on the right, resting sack in one game. Jesus through the middle. Uh, we got five subs. That works for me. You wouldn't even have to change styles massively to kind of move those around before, during, in-game. So I think we can get loads of mileage out of, say, Eddie and Jesus. Um, and if we assume Tielemans is coming in, or somebody just like him, somebody Gundogan-y, that's my kind of my temp template I'm looking for here. Mm-hmm. And we are now playing in the final third far more often than we were two years ago when we first trialed Eddie, a year and a half ago, even nine months ago, much more like we were in our better games recently when he played rather than our worst game recently, then Eddie starts to make loads of sense for us. He's a guy you want getting on the end of things in the box, in the final third, because we are becoming possession dominant. We're creating chances with Odegaard on one side, Tielemans on the other, party through the middle, Chaka, El Nenny, and Sambi on there too, because we got five subs and we don't want to leave anybody out. And we're uh, joking about the last bit. But you've got guys creating opportunities, Martinelli, Saka. And what you need is a guy arriving at the right moment to put that ball in the back of the net. Eddie makes all kinds of sense. And we don't know what his ceiling is. I've always loved Eddie. We all know that. But I don't know. I know he's good. I don't know if he's... I don't think he's great. But an XG finisher, and we're creating lots of XG, guy with good movement, quick, good on the counter, uh, good pulling defenders with him as he runs up the left-hand side against West Ham. We can use all kinds of that. Um, so, But there has to be an A striker, even if that A striker is Jesus and it's not everybody's classic striker and he, he can play in a couple of positions. And that's a bit more Manchester City-ish where we're more whirling dervishes in the first front half of the pitch, five, six yeah. attackers doing different things, and five subs. I love it. I absolutely love Eddie. And it saves some money from a big signing bonus for the other things we need to do. Yeah, I mean, let's say for a minute that Pepe and Lacazette do go, and I, yeah. I think we assume that'll happen. You've got Smith Rowe, Martinelli, Saka, and who? You have Eddie if you keep him. If you don't keep him, you could convince me you need three more. Three more. Yeah. Um, if you even if you say no, we could get by with two more, that may mean that you have to compromise on the second one and keeping Eddie at a cost that in totality looks relatively cheap when compared with having to go outside the club to get a solution, does allow you to say, we're gonna get that guy we really want maybe it is a 50 million pound gabriel jesus or maybe it's someone else you know whatever and we're going to get the tielemans and we're going to get the left center back we need if we feel we need that and 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 um and that that is really the issue is that there are places that need to be filled and there's europa league football next season and someone's got to play in it you know i i think the one thing though clive that people do is they pretend they know more about a player than they do None of us know enough about Eddie and Kedia, and that includes Arsenal. Now, Arsenal has seen him in training every season, you know, every training in, training out, game in, game out, fine. But, like, Carlos Vela is a good example, I think. Carlos Vela is a player who didn't make it at Arsenal and was very, very good and went on to have a very decent career. At Eddie's age, he scored 14 goals with 10 assists, helping Real Sociedad to a Champions League place in La Liga. Okay, he moved on to the U.S. later in his career and had a 34 goal and 10 assist season. To be fair, it's MLS, but still, Carlos Vela found his league, found his level, and had a good career. Does that mean we messed up moving on Carlos Vela? I don't think it does. You can be a very good player, but not quite at a certain level, but then you hit the level you're at, 
and you look great. We don't know what that level is for Eddie, and we're really basing Arsenal being his level on a seven-game run. So that seven-game run, could, and, and by the way, that's not totally fair. He's played other times. He's played in Europa League. We've seen that when he gets chances, he has tended to look okay as a finisher, and he's tended to have output. I'm not trying to, to dismiss him. But I think what we have to do is at least admit what we don't know, Clive. And Eddie really is somewhat of an unknown. He's been behind two very expensive strikers in Aubameyang and Lacazette, two very senior strikers as well. And he's played in Arsenal teams that have struggled to create chances, which is that that problem seems to be alleviating itself at some level. So I, I do think that it's fair to say there's a player in there. But what does bother me is when people say, well, this one is different. And the only point I want to make here before I turn this over to you is like, when I said re-signing Aubameyang was a risk I didn't like because of age curves and all the, you know, all the other nonsense that people have um, turned into a meme about me, fine, fair enough, well-deserved. A lot of people said, well, but Oba's different. Oba's different. Some players are different. Jamie Vardy developed late in his career. But pointing to a player who's different and then saying this player will also be different, you don't know. You have to admit what you don't know. Okay, people say, no, he's Tammy Abraham. Tammy Abraham had 26 goal seasons in the championship in his teenage years. He led the line for Chelsea. Then you'd say, well, but he got minutes and Eddie didn't. We just have to accept that it's a very, very small keyhole of information, you know, keyhole we're looking through with Eddie and hope that the club really knows. But I do believe that if he's staying and staying on these wages, that he's going to get his 1,500 to 2,000 minutes next season, Clive. And I just, I think we have to at least acknowledge there's some risk to him being that central to our plan. We don't know how central it's going to be. We don't know how central. Yep. Right now, we don't know how central it's going to be. So what do we know? So we can judge him on match days as fans, because that's what we do. That's all we have. Yep. We can look at our eyes. Our eyes are telling me, and this is somebody, you know, I like to, I love scouting players and looking at players. And I, and I can connect to players. Nearly someone I've struggled with, to be honest, to connect to. So I had to refresh my mind and clean it because I'm thinking, mm. Crikey, you might miss something here. And what you can see straight away that physically he has changed. He has developed. He looks stronger. He looks more assured. He looks like he can hold that lone role himself. So that's a step forward this year. A step forward I did not see. Right? So I did. I was never sure he was a lone forward on his own. I thought he was part of a two. I thought he was a lazy forward off a strong <laughs> ten, like Lacazette in behind him. He needed that support, needed that help. No, I didn't worry about how he approached goals in one-on-one. I thought he snatched chances, dragged shots, stand, stride pattern, standing foot in the wrong place. That comes from confidence. Suddenly his confidence is in mm. place now and his feet are landing in the right spot. He's scoring goals, falling down. I mean, that just <laughs> tells you what it, that's what happens when you feel trusted, when you feel loved, you feel a level of responsibility. Right, and Learned that from Lacazette. Everything's changing, right? He's walking along with a strut. I saw him in a hotel at the weekend. He's like, he's like a boy <laughs> from the hood. He's strutting <laughs> through the reception. I'm thinking, look at you, son. You got Bit the limp on. Walk with the limp. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had the limp. But that's because I was walking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get a taxi across reception, which I would have liked to. Taxi done, for right? Clive. So, mm. so, and I watched him. I'm thinking, look at you. You look like you belong in that tracksuit, mate. You're running, you're running the show. You're playing this afternoon. I could tell from looking at his face he was playing. Do you yep. know what I mean? And um, things change very quickly with young people. You know, you find yourself, you get into that zone in your life where you feel like you're invincible and people listening to us now have all had that moment in your life where you think, I am the man or woman, I am it. I am the one. This is my moment in my life. And he is coming to that moment right now. He's, you know, he, it's, it's interesting to watch. I, I do, in the end, we have to make other people fear us. I don't think re-signing Eddie is going to make everyone think we're going to leap into the top four next season, right? And that's the truth of it. He still has room to build in his CV to have the fear factor that the 29-year-old strikers that run this league have, and there's a message there, they're 29, you know, the Son, yeah. the Canes, Salah, Mane's, you know, look at them. They're not kids. None of them are kids, right? So they've had to build their reputation over many, many years. I think it would be correct. You know, I think we are seeing something developing. I'm sorry, one last thing, Elliot. 
Yeah, please. We, we see match days. They see training days. They see training data. They see information. They see strength data. They see speed data. They see agility data. All the numbers mm. that they run, they see. They can project. They can project where he's going. So we can have a look at him in on match day and say, he looks different. But they know he's different. They know his trajectory. Yep. You know, Carlos Vela, a good example of somebody that was super sharp at a young age. We went to MLS. He was jogging around there, flicking it over goals, flicking it over keepers and things like that. It, it he wasn't an increase. Check. It wasn't an increase in intensity he was looking for. You see what I mean? He, he right. found his level and he dropped away. His level was when he was younger. That was his peak. I think Eddie's peak is to come, and I've learned that. I've learned that myself this year in the second half yeah. of the season for sure. I can't imagine Eddie ever underperforming XG. I just can't see it. So here's the thing, too, though, like the. The period where we played the best football this season also came with quite a lot of contribution from the center forward in the way we played with the ball. And that is a part of his game that I think would have to develop for him to be able to play regularly for Mikel Arteta and thrive. Now, there are many, many ways to play in many types of strikers, and you can be an excellent striker but not be the right fit. Like, do I think Jamie Vardy would be good in the current Arsenal system? I'm not so sure, right? Because it's hit it long, win the first ball, run in behind. I don't know if we want to do that. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways to play. And I, I think for Eddie to really be a fit for us, we will need to see him come up a little bit in, in terms of his, his linking play, his connection, his ability to help pick the lock a little bit when we're in possession. Um, Clive, can, it sounds can like I you ask you, yeah, yeah. I just, mm-hmm. sometimes when I, when I get lost about a player and I, I get my head up and I look at other clubs, I say, well, how do you compare him to, say, a Patson Dacker at Leicester? That a year or so mm. ago looked quite exciting on the YouTubes, right? Quite a similar player, quite sharp. How do you compare him to him? Would you invest in my Leicester invested in Patson Dacker and let Eddie walk away for free? How do you compare him to Ollie Watkins now? That question a, a year ago wasn't a question. Pretend he's a question right now. How do you compare him to him? A Danny Ings, for example. How do you, and, and there are players around the league, if you start to go through the teams, you start to think, actually, you know, maybe someone like a Che, uh, was it Che Evans or Che Adams? That's che Adams, country. yeah. I quite like him, nice, strong player. And you start to compare these players who are first, second choice for their teams. And you think, well, Eddie's going to be a rotational forward. And he stands up against those guys now. Do you see what I mean? And, mm. Or he stands up to a point where you think, actually, Eddie's still improving. He can go past them. Do I have to do the outlay on him because I let him go because I'm dumb for free? Do I need <laughs> to go and do the outlay, outlay to, to get somebody in who's who's as good as him and it costs us money rather than pay the money for somebody established, one or two established players that bring in a different attribute to the group that allows us to play in many different ways and I'm, I'm talking myself around to it because there's because yeah. of the, what you said earlier, unknown potential. And, and I think and he's on the just, right trajectory. Yeah, I, I think we just have to admit that we know less than we think we know and that he's a player that's still developing. But like this last seven games, right? Eddie Hinketty has scored in three of his 21 Premier League appearances. And that's it. Those, That's what we have on him. Now, all of that came in the last seven games, and I think he looked pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm not dismissing it. I just think that when we are looking through a keyhole and trying to reach an evaluation, we have to admit that we don't know. And when you start to use the counterfactual and you say, well, this player at his age was doing better. This other player at his age was doing better. This other player at his age was doing better. And you start saying things like, yeah, but... Those yeah buts, it doesn't mean they're not true. Yeah, but Tammy Abraham Abraham had more opportunities. Yeah, but Lukaku had grown into his body at that age. Like, I'm not saying those things aren't true. But if you find yourself yeah butting a lot, you have to at least acknowledge that the counterfactual is relevant. That's all I'm saying, that it's relevant. That at 23 years old, which he will be maybe by the time you're listening to this, a lot of the players that you'd be interested in having at this position have kind of proven themselves. But because the economic basket does not contain huge risk, as I said at the start of this, and as long as we strengthen in the ways I think we need to around him, I can certainly justify us doing this. I can't say whether I think it'll work out or not because admittedly, I think that's sort of a coin flip. 
I really do. The only point I'll make, and I think this is really important, so much of how mad we get or how excited we get about stuff in the transfer window is about sequence. It's about sequence. If our next signing is a center back, and our next signing after that is a fullback, and our next signing after that is a DM, people are going to be furious. But if at the end of the window we buy three strikers and an eight, everyone's going to be happy. A lot of it's about sequence. And right now, the decision to resign Eddie and El Nenny may have some people worried. But if we get Gabriel Jesus and Yuri Tielemans and maybe another six and maybe even another forward, then we're going to say, oh, Eddie and El Nenny seem like sensible ways to just keep the fringes of the squad, the, the meat of the squad, healthy and, and moving forward and not losing Eddie for free. And sure, you know, so sequence becomes really important. And that leads us into the next discussion, which is Mohamed El Nenny. And Clive, like the younger me, loved to get outraged about everything. <laughs> Love to care about everything. <laughs> and I need him right now. I need to channel him because I find myself unable to really have a take about Mohamed El Nini staying. I think in a world where Mohamed El Nini has to give you spot minutes here and there, fine. In a world where Mohamed El Nini is starting seven games in a row in the run in, I think you're in trouble. And I think there are limitations there. But he's a glue guy, he's a dressing room guy, he seems to really like Arsenal. I cannot imagine we are paying him very much. I mean, again, the total outlay for this contract may come in at under three million pounds. Like, you know, I mean, sorry, per season. So call it a you know a six or six or nine million pound outlay total over three, two or three seasons. It feels like a move that says we we are probably going to target strengthening other qualities in the midfield, like the eights. And we just want to make sure we have enough options at the sixes. So that's that's how I see it. Do you see it any differently? Yeah, similar. I think I think he's he's here to allow other younger players to develop. We have Sambi, he needs to develop, and we have a young player called Charlie Patino that needs to develop. Now I think by having on any around, he seems to be somebody that young players look up to. Um mm -hmm. there are there is room for in any squad for people that set the examples and play to a decent level. I think the way we play now, we can all see it. We play with a lone, uh, lone six, and we have people spinning around that player, you know, in, in the various pods at the base and the sides, right? So, and he has proven to me he can play the lone six. He 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 has a natural responsibility to play that role. He knows what it is. I like to see his shoulders turn around a little bit more on the clock. So he sees it a bit more on the half turn, so he's going to go one direction. I think towards the end of the season, as the pressure came on, I felt he was facing his centre-backs a lot as he received it. But hey, look, it's the, that's something to... I, and there are things he can't do and he's not going to get better at. But he playing that role, he can do it. I've seen it, he can do it. And he will allow others to develop around him. I see it, again... If we get a number eight that can do things that none of our current midfielders can do today, then we're all in, right? We are all in. We have a group of centre mids that we can shuffle, combine, find a new balance, and it makes sense. But that number eight has to come in. It has to come in. If we go with the same group, and what we have to look forward to is the growth of Sambi Lakonga alone, that isn't enough to keep us all on board, right? So yeah. we need something new in there. And he he provides a platform for those players to come in. Instead of looking at players as just players, Paul, I think you look at them as the group, right? I remember there was a funny season. It might have been like seven or eight seasons ago. And Arsenal would post the squad, you know, like on the website. And there'd be the first team squad. And it would have like forwards, midfielders, defenders, goalkeepers. And when they posted it that season there were three midfielders. And I remember everybody being like, well, that's not good. <laughs> um, if you think of the group as, let's just say it's Yuri Tielemans for, for timing. Let's put a placeholder on that, but let's say, and you say it's Tielemans, Odegaard, Shaka, Party, Sambi, El Nenny. That group feels sufficiently stocked. I don't think it feels sufficient in quality. The next thing I'd want to do would be to take that El Nenny piece and, and think of it Think of it like, um, almost like Jenga. 
take that El Nenny piece off and then put a better piece on top that becomes a first team player, right? A starter or a guy who can compete for a starter. But yeah. for now, if that's the group and you're saying party, Tielemans, Odegaard, that's the 4 3 3 group we use when they're all fit. And then if one has to come out, Shaka comes in. And if another has to come out, maybe Sambi comes in and it's time for him to take that step. And if another comes out, maybe Elneny comes in. If it's Party who comes out, maybe it's Elneny. But if it's Tielmans who comes out, maybe that becomes a Sambi role or a Smith Rowe role. The group feels sufficiently robust if we do that. The next step I'd want to see would be another really, really good six. But do you think looking at it as a, as a group, it looks sufficiently well re- well stocked if we get that eight that we talked about like a Tealman's or whatever and keeping El Nenny because to me it's again let's be honest what these are the Enkedia move and, and the El Nenny move Paul you know what they are they're they're bargains they're budget moves they're moves you make so that you can put your money somewhere else if we were Manchester City Let's be honest what we'd be doing. We'd be getting rid of Enkedi and Elneny, and we were replacing them with starting quality players and getting then two more on top of them. We can't do that. So we're keeping these players who we feel we can get by with so we can put the resources into another option. That's that's the only way I see it. Yeah. Uh, Elneny, if he's nothing, he's solid. Uh, his spacings, his he, he follows instructions. He's, he's the safe option when you need a safe option. Um, I think we, if you brought in a Tielemans and a Chaka, you had Ch- Chaka stays, you can play a 4-3-3 three, three with Party or with El Elneny. Uh, you can rest Odegaard with Tielemans on the right. You can play Tielemans on the left instead of Chaka, doing a very Chaka job, as we've seen over the last couple of months. And like in all of this, what am I doing? I'm not talking about Mohamed Elneny. I'm, he'll just be behind... Uh, there are games where he'll be perfectly sufficient and the sizzle you're looking from, for from Mohamed El Nenny will come from, say, Tielemans and Odegaard ahead of him. Um, and uh, Tommy Asso to his right. And his job will be to feed the ball simply to the guys uh, who can put on some sizzle for us. And that'll be okay. Mm. You wouldn't want it for a lot of games. We've right. got, it's going to be a hell of a schedule. And all those guys we're talking about are off to the World Cup, aren't they? including Sambi, mm-hmm. every last one of them. And they're all going to be playing two games a week. And then you look at our summer, our transfer window, and we've seen before we can run into trouble with our bandwidth, just scouting, getting people in, recruiting. Okay. True. Of course, yeah. the scouting recruiting is dumb, but the deals aren't done. And we saw last year, we need players in before the season starts. Like we got crucified in the first three matches because the pl- we had signed the players basically, but they weren't in. Um, they were all well on their way, but we did not have them. Um, so, you know, you got Eddie in, you got El Nenny in, and say we're getting five players, saying we're getting, say we're getting six players this summer. We got two done. Focus, focus on getting the four over the line. Quick start. P- people in place. There's just not a huge amount to say about Mohamed El Nenny. Good guy. Nice guy. Knows the system, disciplined. We're ready to go. Uh, he's happy to play a bit and be. It puts him in the frame for Egypt and the World Cup, and he'll play games with the Europa League. And he he is not going to block Sambi's way if Sambi's good. So, it, yeah, it, it's almost it's almost it should become a moot point. Sambi should start to unless we send him out on loan for some reason. Sambi should start to grow into the role this year. He's had. They only thought he was going to acclimate, acclimatize for both cultures there uh, last <laughs> season. He, at one stage, he played way more than they expected, probably across the season. They were happy enough with the amount he played. Um, I think Sambi's a real player, and he may be the sizzle we're, we were hoping for from a new signing in El Nenny's spot. Between the two of them, they may give us everything we want as Sambi evolves across the season. He'll, Sambi will do some... Europa League stuff and get going there. And I think we've got a lot of good options there. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, again, I, I can only look at it this way. If we were a club with endless resources, and I mean, there's some of you that may say, we, we do have endless resources because we have a billionaire owner, but you know what I mean? Access to endless resources. Um, 
I think what we would do this summer would be get in two strikers and get in two midfielders. And El Nenian and Ketty would be off. I do think this is a budget move. I do think that instead of getting Asim Hen and Gabriel Jesus for $160 million, and then getting Tielemans and, I mean, take your pick, who's the, who's the midfielder du jour, that, uh, Chuameni, let's say, for another $150 million and spend $300 million, that's the move you'd make if you're City. But the move we're making is half of that. Jesus and Tielemans, no awesome hen or too many, keep Enkedia, keep El Neni. And we're going to build over time. And like, you're laughing, Clive. We're about I, to transition I, I, to transfers, I, so don't worry. We're going we're gonna to dig into this. But like, that's, that's it, right? Like, I described the way City would do it, and I described the way we're doing it, and the only difference is about 300, 150, 100, or 200 million pounds of spending, right? Yeah, I'm not sure even City would do that I mean, because they, even, even they would get. I mean, they just bought Erling Holland. I mean, I don't know what you know. What, what do you need them to prove to you? Yeah, he, he only cost them fifty-one million pounds. Right? Wait, till <laughs> so, see, wait till you see what they're paying him. Yeah, yeah. But, um, the, He's going to be able to afford Aubameyang's fleet of Lamborghinis. All the other stuff is under the carpet, right? So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think. Um, Hey, look! I was laughing at your sudden certainty about what we're gonna do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah. It's quite amusing. Yeah, look, I, it's the first. I'm step, talking right? style, not not specifics. You it's, know, it's, the, it's, it's the first step. Your point about sequence is a really good one. It's the first step. We all know this team needs to be redefined by its forwards. We signed on uh, um, an inexperienced forward as, the fir- as our first move, and everyone's gone. Mm, yeah, that seems sensible. But there's a big butt on the end of it. There's a butt. Don't you mess me about now. <laughs> I need more than this. <laughs> when you, you say there's mean? a big butt on the end of it and I don't say anything, that's just because I couldn't come up with anything I could say in response that would be in, <laughs> even remotely accepted by the, by the totality <laughs> of the audience. Here, go there's ahead. a big butt on the end. We're, this is incomplete. <laughs> and there, there, are, there are things we need to do. And, we, and, we, and, I, and I generally, I, it's very important because these players, any someone that can play in our system, we need players that enable others to be even brighter than they were this season. And that is really key. And having that ability, authority, experience, physicality, presence that we have lacked for many a week. We have scored goals in a collective way, in a tactical way, in a pattern way. And we've done it in combinations with small combinations and distances and then created in that way we have some creative talent that can get the ball into the area near it but then we need forward creativity and authority to win jewels and we haven't got enough of it consistently we haven't got any half chance merchants and we really need that and when we get that everything looks beautiful the coach looks great we all look great everything looks great when you've got a good forward you're a great coach you really are you know, and we yeah. haven't done, we haven't invested in forward areas. I'm so interested to see what Arteta does because he still hasn't signed one yet. He's re-signed people, but he hasn't signed one from the outside yet. And I'm so interested to see what he does. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, this, we're going to find out, I think, a little bit at least about what he thinks of how you build an attack, maybe for the first time. The big butt joke, I, I probably could have done something on the Lacazette front there. But I would have needed to workshop it. I don't know what it would have been. So definitely write in with how you would have uh, worked in a big butt joke there. But for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, I don't recommend it. Face for radio and all that. You may have seen me drinking a drink that I have quite enjoyed, and that is my Athletic Greens AG1. And I got to tell you, I use it literally every day. I take it every day. This The, the uh, package I'm about to tell you about comes with travel packs. Brought them to London. Only reason I survived 4 a.m. of heavy drinking four nights in a row. Let me tell you. It, um, it wasn't the energy, kebabs, no? I mean, the kebabs got me in into bed safely. The AG1 got me recovered the next day. Um, and, and look, it's about digestion. It's about energy. It's about focus. The gut health component is so important. Like, I find that that, that is something that nothing I took really helped with that. It's replaced a counter full of multivitamins and gummies all filled with sugar and stuff like that that I don't take anymore. It's 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, okay? You take it once a day, mix it with some water, off you go. 
Um, it's a small microhabitat with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take great care of your health. Um, a, a, one thing that I think is so important to reference because different people have different lifestyles in the way they eat uh, or allergies to things. So it's keto, paleo, vegan, daily free, gluten free, contains less than one gram of sugar with no artificial anything. So you're good to go. It supports better sleep quality and recovery. Great also if you exercise, if you're an athlete, it was designed by an athlete and is supported by athletes. And um, they're also not just a sustainable company, but a company that supports No Kid Hungry, and they've donated over 1.2 million meals. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of uh, immune-supporting vitamin D supplement and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash vision. It's time to reclaim your health. Arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash vision to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I literally just finished mine. You're going to love it. Do it now. Now, you got your body taken care of. Let's get your business taken care of. And the way we get your business taken care of is we stock it with the right talent. McKellen Edu literally doing that right now. Unfortunately, there's no Indeed for the transfer market, although there should be, because Indeed is the one place where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed partners with you every step of the hiring process and saves you time instead of being on multiple job sites bouncing around nonstop. With Instant Match, my favorite feature, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description. And you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Join more than 3 billion businesses worldwide. That's not right. There aren't 3 billion businesses worldwide. 3 million businesses worldwide. 3 million businesses worldwide that you use Indeed to hire great talent. Brain's still on London time. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through April. Uh, no, nope, that's not right. Offer ballot for a limited time. Go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire to claim your $75 sponsored job credit. Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Offer valid for a limited time. Need to hire? You need Indeed, Clive. Is that enough of that? Indeed. Nailed it. Okay, my friend. It's coming. It's coming. Transfer talk. We're getting into the season. We did a Tielemans. Yeah, I know you love it. We did a Tielemans scouting video, and you should be watching it, my friends. Paul watched it. He said it was good. I'm taking the credit, even though it wasn't directed at me. It was a little asterisk that said, and Elliot at the end. Your mileage may vary. Paul, we know we need to get the striker component right. I think Gabriel Jesus is, I think there's enough smoke there that there's probably fire. I think we are looking at that. Whether or not it gets done remains to be seen. And I, I do think there's this sort of neat thing happening with the striker market where strikers are hard to buy. And if you look at where the money has gone buying strikers, it hasn't worked out very well for a lot of clubs. And as a result, I think there's been this new model, Liverpool certainly employ it, which is to buy talented forwards that you feel are versatile and high quality, build a group of three, and play them wherever you want to play them. So at Liverpool, for example, maybe Jota's on the left and maybe Diaz is through the middle or Diaz is on the left. Sadio Mane played through the middle. Salah's usually on the right. But, you know, and and they do have Firmino maybe a little more strikery, but Jota has played wide. Diaz has played wide. Sadio Mane's played wide, played through the center. So I, I think it can make sense to do that because it gives you more flexibility and you're less required to really nail your, your evaluation. But in midfield... I think it's very different. I think it is much more deployment-based. Yves Basuma might be a good midfielder, but you wouldn't want him playing eight. You want him playing six, right? You, these these qualities are different. I went to the Palace game in the fall, and I thought Odegaard looked probably the worst we've seen him this season to some extent, playing in more of a double pivot role. But he's been brilliant when playing the eight, and that leads us to Yuri Tielemans. I really do think this is the player we're looking at. I really think we have a chance to get it done. I think I misunderstood him until I did this scouting video because there's been so many memes about him this season walking back defensively, not running back. And maybe some of that is that he was just done with Leicester. Not a great sign for his professionalism, if true. But you put that guy in the left half, or most of the videos, on the right half space between the lines, and you're going to see elusiveness. You're going to see good shooting. You're going to see beautiful in-swinging crosses from the top of the box and through balls for days. I really think if we can put that in the left half space and bring that side of the attack to life, 
so that you jo- don't just close down the sack of Odegaard pod. I think that's going to really bring our attack to life. So I have just finished the section on Telemans. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Okay. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's your take? Let me stop talking and turn it over to you. How do, how do you feel about that idea, though, that buying midfielders is much more about the way you're going to deploy them and that this guy looks like he fits exactly what we need in that spot? Yeah, look, I've been struggling for, like, I think we needed somebody Gundogan-y. Uh, I said that before. That's that's what I see on in the Chaka job he's been doing there, that slider job where you're, you're a bit of, si- bit of a six when you're under pressure or you pick up the ball back there. Um, Tielemans is so press resistant. I had a conversation yesterday on the Twitters with somebody who was like, yeah, but we need beefier players. That wasn't the word used, but more physical (laughs) midfield, blah, blah, blah. But like, that's not how we do it. Or that's not how we want to do it. We want a guy who can take the ball and embarrass you with his first touch and open up space so that you stop pressing him. Santi Cazorla never needed to be beefy, right? Yep, nope. And uh, you got, imagine party and Tielemans dropping back to pick uh, pick up a quick ball from him, and somebody comes rushing in to make a fool of themselves. Well, they won't keep doing that. And suddenly, Tielemans has passed that guy, streaks up to the edge of the box. His anticipation, his vision is his final ball. He can do anything with the ball. He's There are only a few players who have the map, who have the vision, who are half a second quicker than everybody else on the pitch mentally. Tielemans, I don't know where world he starts, but he's awfully darn close, I think. That's my, that's my feeling on it. Yeah. Clive can take my feelings and put it into words. He can tell me why I feel mm-hmm. these things. I can see it on the screen and try and decipher, but but I don't have I don't have the vocabulary, the the grammar for it. But like No, I I think you do. Oh, okay. I, th- I think you do. He, here's he, the only question I have with Tielemans, as we've said, is we really haven't seen him play on the left. The good news is, and I was yeah. here's a little bit of very basic stats. I, I was having a look at Left footedness versus right footedness footedness. Cause if you're gonna if you're gonna switch from the right to the left, like he's got all the skills, he's got the touch. I've seen him turn both ways. Um as a player playing on the right, he does twenty four percent of uh, his touches with his left foot. Uh, now, that may not seem high to some. It's really, really high. We don't have a player in our team, I think, uh beyond um the Guess who our standout uh, two-footed player is? I might have given it away in the WhatsApp chat. Granit Xhaka. No. Granit Xhaka. He's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's Tommy Asso. Tommy, Tommy Asso, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, Tommy yeah. Asso. He is 45%. That's Santi levels. That's astounding. Normal players. So someone who is really good is Gundogan. He's 38% with his left. In our team... N- nobody's up there. Saka's close, uh, closest. Saka is. Hang on here. Where are you? Yeah, bugger. Twenty five percent. Tielemans hmm. twenty, and you kn- you know how good he is with both feet. Tielemans is twenty four percent. So that gives me some level of confidence, apart from just watching him and he can do anything, turn either way, pass either way. He does use both feet. Um, that he can do that. He can be the left eight for us. And of course, he's already proven he's a right eight. Uh, A couple of other interesting stats along the way. Our lowest left-footedness score, our most one-footed player is, Elliot? Mohamed El El Nenny. Very good. 5%. You don't need two feet to pass it back to your center back, Paul. Just a tap. It's just a wall pass. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The guy hops around the pitch on one foot. I would not have guessed (laughs) that, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually. Interesting. Um, Yeah, Clive, I I think when you're buying a player too, what you're asking is, what do I currently have in that position? And does this make that better, right? So, like, look at Granite Shaka. Granite Shaka deserves a lot of credit for being good enough as a player that you can kind of use him in a lot of different ways. If he needs to play left back, if he needs to play center back, he can kind of make it work, think his way through it. This season, during our best run, he played left eight. That's where he played on the slant from Thomas Party. But when you watch him, 
especially when we're countering or whatever it is. What does he do? He drops back to be a release. He he trails the play to be available as a safety valve. He he will play the the lateral pass, but maybe not the first time pass through the lines or take it on the first touch out of his body and second touch through to the runner. That's not because Granite Jack is not a good player. It's because he his instinct is that possession six, right? Keep it, keep it moving, ball retention, recycling, big switches, things like that. Tielemans, one touch out of his boots, one touch through. Step past a man when they're on the counterattack, run in, join, get to the edge of the box, take a shot. It's not a question of is Tielemans better than Shaka. It's a question of does Tielemans give us something in the left eight that Shaka could not. And I really think he does. And as a team that was so one-sided in the way we attacked, I think that's huge. So is that part of it? Not just his quality, but his ability to give us traits in a position that that we're missing when when we played our best football this season. Yeah, just, just talk about Shaka, actually. As you were talking about him, I suddenly was just drifting away thinking, mm, he, he's a player that's really, if we, could, if we could pick a position for him, it'd probably be double six. Have somebody good like him, yeah, yeah, like a, like you know, double six. Him and party stay next to each other, slightly just up on the seesaw, slightly, right? So um, he did well you, with Ramsey in a back three. Remember that when we had that little run in, and Ramsey could go and he could sit. Yeah, and Ramsey but he was, back but he was, he was a lone six with three centre backs behind him protecting his yeah, mistakes, yeah, right? Mm, and true. Ramsey mm. was one one. It's a one plus one midfield, right? So um, that suited his distribution skills. So double six would probably be the position he would pick. But he's actually, you look at him and you think, actually, you could, you could be a centre-half, but, you know, you could be a left-back, you could be an eight. Sometimes for Switzerland, he plays as a ten, you know. But, you know, I don't think he's world-class at any of them, but he's passable at any of them. And I think he's almost got <laughs> he's almost got Milner qualities. Do you know what I mean by that? I was just going to say James Milner, yeah. yeah. And, I totally agree. And he's growing. <laughs> who would have said Great Shaq is growing into a Milner? But he he's a, he's the first one to put his hand up to say, "I'll I'll stand there. I'll play there for you, boss." Do you know what I mean? And uh, he protects players, enables players. So yeah, but Tielemans now. So the first thing I'm going to say back to your earlier statement: look at it as as a group of players. But what does he do that's different? And I feel with our set midfields, apart from party, when the ball comes into party. I feel there's a opening of possibilities when the ball comes into him. Possibilities that I can't see from Asseti. He'll beat somebody, do something, and the next thing opens up. I see very similar with Tielemans. And they're people that not only got the the GPS on, they're people that have the ability to manipulate the ball from one foot to the other. So two-footedness for me, it's not just passing with two foot, it's your ability to move it from one foot to the other quickly. Right? So Granit shaka has got quite a decent two-footed score, Paul was, was reading earlier. But it takes three months to go from one foot to the other, right? So that while well, that's happened, the picture's changed, it's shut. You've got 50 men around and the ball's been pressed off you. Tielemann's ability to receive it, do something with his first touch, beat you off your first touch, and then create something else that wasn't available two seconds earlier. That, to me, jumped off the screen. And with our midfields, what happens is, we can all see. We can. As the ball goes into them, we're all saying, "Okay, pass it there." We know you can do that. There's nothing else I can see that you can do. Do you know what I mean? Keep it going. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Because the ingenuity is in Saka. It's in Martinelli. It's in Odegaard. It's in Smith Rowe. Our behind the ball players are quite functional, apart from Partey. And so when I see Tillemans, who can play behind the ball as an eight, help us progress the ball. But the possibilities that are in his boots are multiple. First time passes of both feet, banning shots of both feet, sweeping De Bruyne across his from both sides. I mean, this is a lot here, right? So now I, I went to the word De Bruyne. And I, I love to use players to help people see what a player could be. As soon as I do, someone says to me, he ain't De Bruyne, Clive. Do you know what I mean? I feel like, oh, bloody yeah, I'm bloody Nobody is. Anyway. That's not the point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nobody is. But you watch him sweep the crosses in. You watch him shoot. And in Man City's midfield, they have a player that can stride away from people, that can bang shots, make the difference between the 8 and the 10 roll around the edge of the area. When everyone else's heart rate is going boom, 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 they have the ability to do something significant there. 
We yep. do not have that player in our squad anywhere, and he has not been developed. Do you see what I mean? There's nothing coming. You know, so it seems like a good attribute buy. Maybe Smith Rowe or no? Like uh, Smith Rowe, I, I've I've toyed with me and Tim had a discussion about this, so he, whether he's an interior or an exterior player. At this moment in time, he for me he's a a Robert Pires player on the left inside and inside forward starting out there. But I'm coming in because my fullbacks come in and my centre forward's running away, and there's a little pocket there for me to play in, much like Pires with Ashley Cole and Thierry Henry. That space that's ripped free because people are stretched around me i can now sit in there and use my brains that's what i think he is compared to martinelli who would be the guy that stretches on that position he's more of a link player starting from the left in my opinion yeah and that, that, yeah, can pop, i add uh, a little bit so the other thing like your de Bruyne's and your Tielemans, i believe and your odegaard's bring is a map a vision a kind of a picture how it's all going to unfold that nobody else sees like I love Smith Rowe. I think he's very clever with his combo, but he's clever in seeing the combos that get him to where he wants to go. He's not seeing the picture of the whole game. Tielemans brings a lever, a, a, a kind of a matrix like intelligence in that area of the pitch that a De Bruyne has the pass that nobody else sees. And you gasp. Yeah. I mean, I, I would Into like to the gasp box. And in a, in a good way. A good guess, the box. not a, oh my God, I can't believe the giveaway. The funny thing is the one area watching him on that uh, scouting video where he did seem similar to, to Shaka is his tackling in that I don't think he slides his feet to get in position. I think he reaches, he reaches with a leg whereas Shaka reaches with an arm. I think he can get beat when he gives the ball away, he's beaten, right? Like when Shaka gives the ball away, the problem is he's dead. He's, he's beaten. And I think Tielemans has that too. Um, and so I'm sure there's some people that would like just a little bit more physicality and pace in that position. I'm comfortable with this though. I think the technique is there, Clive, but how do you respond to the idea that like that player should be someone with a little more of a burst, someone who can make the recovery runs. Cause he, he cannot make the recovery runs. No, in, no, my, no. in my view. <laughs> Mate, if, if you go past him, then he, he, he's, he's standing at the bus stop waiting for the next bus to come. Right. So it's, it's over. Mm. But what he does, I don't, I don't mind that. He, well, Football's becoming a different game now. It's a game that's played literally in inches. It's not played yeah. in 10 meter bursts anymore unless the game's completely broken open. Right? So it's a game of what do you do in inches? You're being pressed to death. What do you do in inches? Can you see a picture? I want to get your head down. What, what can you do? That's what the game is now. The fitness of these players is making the pitch almost too small. You know, it's incredible the fitness levels that we're seeing in the modern game. There's a game in inches, you've got to be able to play in crowd scenes and look after the ball in crowd scenes and have vision, and he has that. And what he does yep. to cover his weakness is that he focuses on looking at the pattern of play for the opposition, see where they're passing, and he steals. He runs up and he steals, and he almost mm. counter-presses. I'm not sure it's the right phrase, but he counter-presses you. So he gets you early. I say I, the phrase I use is he gets you early in the tackle count. He wants to get you before you get going. Because once you got yep. going, it's a problem for him. So he intercepts, reads, counter presses, and takes the ball for you when you least expect it. And that is football gold. That creates transitions yep. when you're least when you're least organized. Create transitions. He gets it. He stays in his feet. He wants to keep it. And then he gives it and we're off and running, right? If he's at his extremities, he goes to ground because he knows once he's done, once he gets into a foot race, he, he'd do a slide tackle. I, I, I know that. I do that myself. <laughs> so when the, <laughs> you, you have to do that to get when you're at your extremities. So he, he, he when my two-year-old's running away from me, I need to get her shoes on. We need to go off to daycare. I find a slide tackle. It's just slide the easiest tackle. way to recover it's the, the position. It's the easiest way yep. to do it. Otherwise, she'll, she'll mm-hmm. run down the road and that's it. You never catch She's her. She's right? so, yeah, exactly. so, um, She wasn't running towards goal. <laughs> 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 and and so yeah so i don't mind he defensively he knows what he can't do and he and he covers it by using his brain to create offensive transitions and that is the gold dust of football so although he has obvious defensive weaknesses obvious to the human eye we can see him chundering back right when he's doing that same run forward looks a different animal to one he's coming back 
right? So mm. reminds of Danny Sabias, really. When he was running forward, he looked like a gazelle. When he was coming back, he looked like John Inman, right? So that's an issue for him. So, <laughs> so, so, but I, I do like Tielemans. Keep going, you're on a roll. <laughs> I do, I do like Tielemans. I do like he again his possibility. Now he brings a level of authority. We're trying to remember this, guys. Remember this. We all love players. I love them all. I, I've looked at hundreds today, it feels like. <laughs> but you need to say, stamp, this one's coming in. That's going to lift the level of this group. They've got Tielemans now. Two, three years ago, he was, well, not even that, a year ago, he was 60 million. Right? Because of his contract situation, it's going to be half that. Right? So, May yeah, night, I mean, a, for a 25 million to 30 million pound. That, that's the other thing, right? You're getting someone from the Premier League who plays exactly the role that you feel you can upgrade at a fee that doesn't stop you from going off and doing the other things you want to do. And here comes Elliot with the one thing he always has to reference. He's just turned 25. I mean, he's going right into his prime, which I think becomes more important when you say, look, 20-year-old on the right, 20-year-old, well, I guess let's go to next season, 21-year-old on the right, 21-year-old on the left, 23-year-old in the other eight Maybe if Enkedia plays a lot, another 23-year-old at, at nine, you know, J- J- Jesus, though, Jesus is going to be about 25. So you start to add those prime age players in to help support them. I think what's neat is if you go to FB Ref, for example, and you, you put the pages next to each other and you look at just the, the green bars, people like to make fun of the green bars and sometimes the green bars are used in ways mm. that they shouldn't be. But you, and you put him next to Shaka, who was playing in that eight this season. Let's be clear. He played eight. And you look at them side by side you see immediately what you're upgrading and what you're changing. You get goals and expected goals. You get assists and expected assists. You get shot creating actions. Shaka did that too, to be fair. You get maybe a little less pass completion, but you get more uh, chances created. You get more progressive passes received, meaning he gets into more advanced areas to receive the ball, right? So you're going to get you're going to get a lot of these things that I, I think we could have used. I mean, there are things you're going to lose also in that I don't think we'd want to be in a situation where we'd have to turn to him in a double pivot if we were going to have to switch that. You know, the other thing it does, and we'll finish on this just by saying, we didn't really have to live without Martin Odegaard at any point this season. But, you know, you have to at least know. Like, remember when we said during our good run, we all said it. <clears throat> The one player this system won't work without is Thomas Party, And then we lost Thomas Party, And sure enough, the system didn't really work very well, did it? The other player might have been Martin Odegaard. We don't have anyone else to play that position. Now, the irony is we went on a three-game losing streak with Odegaard, but kind of without Odegaard after the interlull. As Clive would point out, you know, he comes back from these international breaks like a, a, a phantom. And phantom Martin Odegaard in those three games, we lost all three of them. So I think this gives us a way to flex around Odegaard, take some of the burden off him, open up the left-hand side so guys like Smith-Rowe and Martinelli come more into the game instead of being very peripheral figures. It also lets us be, I think, a little less fullback dependent, which is is good because I think Shaka being the eight meant that the left-back had to be, was it was a more critical component of the build-up. And you actually saw that the game where uh, Tomiyasu played on the left, it was against Leeds, I think, was probably the best Martinelli game in some ways in terms of the way the left side um, contributed to the attack. So we were very fullback dependent in terms of how our our wings, our flanks performed. I want to shift gears just a little bit before we say goodbye. One of the things I like to do, and we're going to do a more thorough version of this. We always put our season predictions uh, into a podcast. And then on the website, we post them. And you can find it. You can go to arsenalvisionpodcast.com, go to stuff, click on season predictions and see what we predicted. To be fair, this season it was difficult because we did the predictions before the window closed and the window made a big, big difference. It's also the fact that we were making those predictions you know, before yeah, before the season started and before the window closed. So we, we didn't even know who the team was going to be. But I just want to get one thing from each of you. One thing you think you were wrong about this season. It doesn't have to be a prediction. An idea, a thought, something going into it you weren't sure about, and one thing you were right about. So let, let's start with wrong. Paul... If you had to think about something that you thought going into the season or felt you understood about the squad or the players or the manager, whatever it might be, what is the thing that you you feel you got wrong looking back on this season that you, you've updated your opinion on or maybe changed your opinion on? 
Well, I'll take suggestions because I'm, I'm wrong you a lot. N- nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Um, I might go with, um, like, I, I was pretty convinced that Obama Yang had to work for us to have a good season. And Obama Yang never really worked for us this season. We yep. played him centrally. We weren't particular. We were not good with him central. Uh, we flirted with taking, uh, I think we flirted with him once or twice playing with Lacazette and then quickly moved to just Lacazette. Um, I did, now, uh, you know, I, I've always liked more than most Lacazette in the middle. Um, I didn't think we could have a, a successful season without Aubameyang being successful. And that was absolutely a key to our season. And we yep. did it, we adapted and did it in other ways. And it wasn't not having Aubameyang that undid, undid us for me. It was not having two right backs and party. Um, and sure, I would have liked a more ready striker off the bench. But um, it, it was. It ended up being more squad depth than, than just not Aubameyang. And... And you just like you just don't know how your season's going to unfold, and I thought Obama Yang was a kind of a binary for us: make that work or we're screwed. And in fact, it took the courage to rip the bandaid off and say it's not going to work or not going to work well enough, and we're going a different way, and we need to move beyond him, and he needs to go, and we need to get him out of our and. Uh, yeah, that combined with the January window where they were super brave, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. Um, some big things happened that, uh, and Aubameyang was definitely not what I saw, uh, the path to our season being. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think that's a fair point. It's, it's almost impossible to look at our predictions where we all predicted Aubameyang and the season is top scorer. And not want to laugh at how dumb we are. <laughs> Look at you, idiots. Yeah. And, and then you very put much yourself because back. he had to be, right? We all we didn't well, pick him because yeah. we were super stoked. He just, how could it work any other way? He has to be. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to think back to last summer when yeah. Pepe had just finished as the hottest player in our team. Coming off consecutive seasons of, you know, being up there as one of our leading scorers. Aubameyang was the captain. I mean, it, we didn't go through a season. We went through an epoch. You know, I mean, the change that has happened here. Clive, is there something that you can find? I've got like seven or eight answers I can give you, but is there anything you think you were wrong about or do you want me to tell you? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, I I, I can't remember what I predicted. I I don't mean predictions, just something that at some point in the season you may have voiced or may have felt strongly about, or even if it was just in your head, an idea you had that you'd like to update now or you've updated, um, you know, as you've watched the season progress. Anything jump to Um, mind like that? I think Eddie was the, the one that I was probably harshest on. Um, more based on missed chances. Do you know what I mean? Nothing more than that mm. and how upset he made me feel. <laughs> that Everton <laughs> so, game. That uh, Everton game. You did I, not I knew it was important. I just knew it was important. I thought it was a, it didn't it. For someone who's a finisher, I thought, well, finish it then, mate. You know, so, um, so that bothered me. Um, the Bamiyang stuff, I'm not sure what I said there. I'm not sure what I said around Pepe neither, but I, I know at the time I liked them both. So I'm sure I'd have said positive things, but for me, uh, seeing Eddie flourish has surprised me a little bit. There's still a limit there, and I'm not saying he's reached a promised land, but that would be one thing that I've I've reset and opened my mind on him for sure. Yeah, no, that that's a good one. So why don't you guys get comfortable? You can mute your mics. I've got I've got about just 30 to 35 minutes of the things I want to say I got wrong here, and then we can move on. No, I'm kidding. We'll, we'll just pick maybe one or two. I think there's two things linked together. One is... I had started to be pretty convinced that Mikel Arteta couldn't, not that he wasn't a good coach. I thought he could coach, but I didn't think he could coach football that would capture my imagination, that I'd get really, get my blood pumping, that I would enjoy watching, that it seemed functional, that it seemed, you know, Chego de Posicion, it's positional football, mate, positional football, it's positional for everything. I got news for you. If the players are in a position, it's positional football. (laughs) But like, but, I was also concerned about that because I looked at who we targeted in the window, a goalkeeper, a center back, a right back, a left back, a midfielder, and an eight. 
And I felt there were other ways we could prioritize. And I said, combine what I know about how he coaches with who he prioritized in the window. And I don't believe this man is going to coach football that's going to get me thinking it's it's the arsenal, the beautiful arsenal. And he found that 4-3-3 system. He migrated towards it. As Paul likes to point out, that Southampton game where it really started to click into place. And then December. And then maybe less, a little bit less in January for reasons we can explain. And then February. And then March. And I watched us play game in, game out. Where, yeah, it, did, it wasn't always perfect. But I enjoyed it. I liked the patterns. I liked the way we attacked. I liked the way we got our, our dangerous players into good positions. And we created chances. And the metrics told me that my eyes were right. Because I like to check the data to see, you know, am I am I missing something the way I watch the game? Because um, sometimes it's watched scowling behind the couch. Um, and so a lot of that also came from Tomiyasu and Benjamin White and Aaron Ramsdale's passing. And so the way he chose to build from back to front didn't just solidify the defense. In fact, you could argue it didn't make the defense any better. But it helped us switch to the system that ultimately created the football that I ultimately think if we're good next season will be the reason why. And I find myself right now believing that Mikel Arteta can coach football that's not just effective, set that aside, but that I can enjoy watching and want to watch. Will we see enough of it next season? That that remains to be seen. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm totally sold because I'm not. But I saw it. I think it's real and I think it can be reproduced. And now he just has to put the few pieces into place at the end. And and that's, as Clive referenced earlier, that's the thing we still need to see. That's the thing. He's he's not put those pieces in at any point since he's been here. And what few pieces he's been connected to, re-signing Aubameyang, signing William, that hasn't worked. So the open question now is what happens when he has to address the final third? And we'll find out this summer because I it's definitely on the agenda. So that's where I was wrong. There are others. Don't worry. There are other things you could have picked. We will come to those on future pods. Paul, let's let's shift gears to a final point, which is something you think you were ultimately, if not proven right about, that you believed or you were sort of thinking about or that was an idea that you had about the season that you feel was sort of borne out watching us this season. Okay. That it was always only the toothpaste. It mm. was, we would see the football when, Clive, I'm going to mute his mic in a second. So just, <laughs> just bear with me. Go, go ahead, Paul. When, when we were good enough to play through the lines, to play from the back, not all the time. We mixed it up quite a lot. This we've talked a lot about that. We launch it from the back often enough. We'll go, mm. long, but when we you, we needed to be able to do both, and when we were able to play football in the final third, we would see the football, not for ten minutes, not for fifteen minutes. And that's why the Southampton game was so key for me. In the first half, actually, we're kind of we play good football. The three zero, I think it's December eleventh. We would play pretty good football, but it's in our half. And in the second half, we stay in their half forty five minutes playing the football. I always thought, don't know why, just feeling or or hope or prayer. Always thought uh, Arteta would and could, and we will as long as he survived long enough, play the good football in the attacking mm. end of the pitch with creativity and we would come to enjoy it. That was my cross my fingers, belief, hope, whatever. Just we needed to take that. And when I saw the signings, that's what I liked about our signings. We we, we signed a centre-back that had all over it the idea that we were going to play with a much higher line and guess what that does? It moves us into play. And the other signings, you could rationalize them all, especially in hindsight. Yeah. <clears throat> play in the final third. That's when it all comes to fruition. It co- goes from mechanical, which is our third, the middle third, to the final third. We started getting pressing. Uh, you know, our pressing numbers as a team look terrible compared to the league. Except when you compare the attacking third, there we're up in the top five pressing teams, but we're not known as a pressing team. That's where we press. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That's it. Clive, um, it will be hard to sift through the literal mountain of good takes you've had this season, but is there something that you feel particularly correct about? Yeah, a little bit of some of that, actually, because I was a big fan of building from the back and having people that can control the football and be confident in possession. And so, from the and first the role moment, of our centre backs and all that, you you were right yeah. on that. Yeah. I, I, it's a big, you know, you can't play football with centre backs that want to stand 
in the North Bank. And that's what I was saying about David Luiz last year. And I could see it and I realised why Chelsea chucked him our way. And I learned from watching him what we don't want to do anymore because the pitch is too big. And players like Danny Sabayas suffered from the big spaces they had to cover. Right? Yeah. And Gwen Dizzy, yeah. they suffered. All right, so you judge people in the framework from which they are forced into. You change the distances from which they play. And um, if, if Tiedemann's got to play David Luiz, guess what we're going to say about him? He can't run. In the small distance we're playing in now, he's perfect, right? So, um, good point. Yeah. So, raising the the line was was key. But one of the things that I'm a big believer in, I'm sh- hopefully I said it enough times because I think I have, or I dreamt it, was the <laughs> the um, the importance of fullbacks, right? The stability that fullbacks mm. give you. When we scouted Tommy Asu earlier, I was thinking this is the guy. I like centre yeah, back, right backs. Mm-hmm. I like to see th- almost roll around in the three and push one up on the other side. And so when we saw Tommy Asu and White, I, saw, I got excited because I could see potentially what we could do. I wasn't sure of Tommy Asu's level, but gee whiz, the first minute he came in, jumped off the plane, packed his duty yep. free under the bench and just ran out there, right? And that was it, <laughs> right? So um, until, he, until he broke down. So I think that, and I think we can all see now the importance of fullbacks in modern football. For me, it's the most important position on the pitch, apart from striker. Um, well, the most important yeah. position, position on the pitch is the one that you haven't got filled correctly. But you see what I mean? As soon as we see the That's instant, true. Yeah. instability at fullback and decisions we've made around fullback has potentially cost us two seasons. It's as simple as that. Our tactical choices around fullback cover have been incorrect and it's cost us two seasons, in my opinion. Right, so yep. that is something we need to make sure we invest in. I would definitely be buying a, another right back. We've got a guy coming back from France, hopefully, who can play the Callum Chambers style right back as well. So we're going to be covered in that right side position. We're going to have people that can play both sides in Tommy Asu if we need to have someone on the left side. We've got Nuno there, who I think people are massively misreading, but let's see what happens if I'm wrong or right. But the, the importance of the backline stability at fullbacks is the key. They are stabilizers. They allow you to progress and play the football you want to play. So that's my big yeah. thing. Well, well said. Um, I'll finish with mine. And like, I have a couple that I want to go to. I thought about having a cheeky one about being right about some transfers, but then I think people would rightly point out that I was dead wrong about other transfers. Um, so I will leave Cedric and Pablo Marie alone for the moment. But um, I think what I'll go with is just the point that I I was repeating myself often last season that I did not think we could be the team we want to be, get where we want to go, be as good as we need to be if we were a low block team. I just did not think we could be a low block or mid block team and do it because to create chances, we had to be so perfect. We had to play back to front. We had to play quick counterattacking football. And we all know the numbers in terms of shots we we took and chances we created and XG and all that. And I really felt that the easiest free money for us in terms of our chance creation was recovering the ball higher up the pitch and transitioning that way. And we weren't like the pressiest team, as Paul pointed out, but we added a press, we recovered the ball, we created chances, and we scored goals by doing that. And recovering the ball up the pitch meant we brought Saka and Martinelli and Smith Rowe and Odegaard and Lacazette or Enkedia into the game instead of maybe, you know, trying to play back to front in ways that we were less built to do. So I, I think that was a good addition. I think we can do even more of it next season. And I think depending on who we add to the team, we may be more cut out for doing that. So we'll see. We're going to do more season recapping. We're also going to do something on Patreon that I think is really cool. We're going to do scouting videos, but for all of our players. So we're going to watch all of Martinelli and Saka and Shaka and Party and and really kind of give our report card on how they did based on rewatching. Because sometimes there's a goal that sticks in your mind and suddenly that player is great because you remember their goal. Then you watch again and you go, eh, there was more to be done there. Maybe Lacazette was better than we thought or worse. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, and that'll probably take the balance of the summer. And right now, Tielemann's scouting video is on the Patreon. So you can check that out. Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks, pause. Woohoo! I'd just like to say Stop. one quick thing. Um, a, lot of, a lot of players are feeling finally the, the safety to come out and uh, kind of reveal a little bit more about their lives and, and their preferences in 
in love and in life. And I just want to tell the world that I love you guys. And mm. you, sure, it's in a platonic way, but it doesn't have to be. And I met you guys, and you guys are just fabulous. And from the bottom of my heart, it was fantabulous, wonderful. You, Tim, you, and you. <laughs> Uh, he says, gesturing at us, for those of you who don't have video. I might put yeah, an extra Paul, person in I mean, there. Look, it was fantabulous. Just fantabulous. Obviously seconded. Meeting you was wonderful. Yeah. We had an amazing time. I, I yeah. loved it. I love it you. And beautiful. I, I'm so proud to be here sharing this together and proud of people who are coming out and expressing who they love in the world because it takes a lot of so courage and, and, and it's a wonderful thing to And all the people we met. You guys have already yes. done this on a proper pod. Yep. I haven't. Yep. All the people I met absolutely loved every one of you. Even the guy who gave me shit for an hour about Chaka and the guy who gave me shit for an hour having bought me a pint about how terrible my opinions are. I loved every minute of it. Thank you. Well said. Paul, uh, thank you, Paul. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. You, you got those messages out before. so we. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming down from it all now and thinking about Retail therapy, as Paul says, right? Yeah, and that's Clive, yeah back into therapy. the transfer market. Oh, all man, right, I'm all in right. my favorite zone. This is great. <laughs> all right, let's get out of here. Uh, we'll have plenty more to come, I promise you. Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, and we'll, uh, yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll continue to do some season recap and, and also look ahead to the transfers as they come. So we love you, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10 transfer window now.